We all have one. It's given to us by someone else. Most of the time in our culture, it's given to us before we take our first outside breath. Sometimes we get this gift because someone we might know or hear about in our futures. Sometimes we get this gift because it's unique. Sometimes we get the gift because it's tradition. Sometimes it's fit, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we give it back. Sometimes we alter it. Sometimes we live with it even though we don't like it. We never ask for the gift. We just get it. And we all get it. I guess that's what's good about it. We all get one. We come to this third week of our Epiphany journey, a journey where we've been invited to ask the question, Who am I? The question's answer often begins with a name. The gift we all get when we're born. Well, in most cases, it's these days before we're born. That hasn't always been the case, though. I could survey the room, and many of you didn't get a name until after you were born. Many of you didn't give your children a name until after they were born, because for some of you, technology to determine a child's sex wasn't available. So when a baby was born, you had to be ready with a girl's name and a boy's name. And for some, if you had one or two or maybe three children, you took great pains in naming the child special after someone dear to the family or to carry on a family name or tradition. If you had more than a few children, you probably were too busy to give a lot of thought to names. Unless you were resembling the Duggar 19 kids and counting family, whose names all begin with the letter J. I confess, when I channel surf, I catch a bit of that show. It's interesting to me how you live with that many kids, and they seem to do it, quite frankly, fairly well. So I channel surf the show from time to time, and I'm sure they must have to do multiple takes for the mom to remember all their names in order. They decided early on to be consistent with naming their kids with the beginning letter J. I wonder, though, what happens if one of them grows up and they don't want to have a J name anymore? Maybe they don't feel like a J name. Or they don't like a J name. Maybe they want to feel unique and be a K name or an S name. Names are important on a number of levels, and in our scripture story today, names play a big part. In our lectionary reading from John, we have two stories. First, the writer of John gives us his version of Jesus' baptism. And you might recall last week, if you were with us, that we reflected on Matthew's version of Jesus' baptism. And by the way, what a day last Sunday was. Fifteen new member water blessings, two baptisms. And a sprinkling of the entire congregation <laughs> as we were reminded of God's love and embrace of each one of us. I want to sneak past the first part of our reading today and give focus to verses 35 to 42. So this story picks up after Jesus' baptism. And unlike Matthew who had Jesus going to the mountain to be tempted after his baptism... John doesn't have a mountain, but John has Jesus immediately begin his ministry. So the next day, after the baptism that is, John was standing with his two disciples. And Jesus walks by and John proclaims, look, there's the Lamb of God. We might imagine these three men. The day before they witnessed Jesus' baptism and the Holy Spirit present like they had never witnessed it before. We might imagine they were still bum-fuzzled at what they had witnessed. Man, what a day we had yesterday. So many coming to be baptized and reminded of God's love and embrace. Sound familiar? And then to top it all off, Jesus himself comes and joins us. Wow, what a day. And then as they're talking, Jesus walks by them. Look, there he is. And without a word uttered, they began to follow him. What's next? They must have wondered. What will we see today? 
Yesterday we saw the Spirit blow through here in a new way. Wonder what we'll see today. Let's follow. Jesus was obviously aware that they were in His shadow and He asked them, What are you looking for? And they answer His question with one word. Their name for Him. They respond simply, Rabbi, which means teacher. And then they ask Him, Where are you staying? It seems to me that these disciples were hungry for the what next. They were hungry for new insights, new revelation of who God is, and perhaps along the way they were hungry for an epiphany of who they were. Jesus invites them, come and see. And they did, staying and learning from Jesus all day. If we read it carefully, there were at least four with Jesus all day. John, an unnamed disciple, and Andrew plus one more, because Verse 40 that Eric read says one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew. Andrew first found his brother Simon and told him, we found the Messiah. Another name drop here. Messiah meaning anointed one. We have found the anointed rabbi who can teach us about who God is. Now keep in mind and make no mistake There were plenty of folks teaching about God. There are plenty of folks teaching about God today. A God of exclusion. A God of oppression. A God of harsh judgment. And there are plenty of folks indifferent to God and a few people. In fact, just the Jewish community that claimed a capital G God in the company of many other gods who were worshipped in the ancient community. The messages that Jesus was bringing about God were contrary to the majority beliefs and certainly ran head on into culture and politics of the day. Jesus was speaking of an inclusive God, a loving God, a God of grace and mercy, a God who welcomed those who were pushed aside, a God who held people accountable for their advocacy for the least. A God who put the last first and the first last as defined by society. Jesus was speaking and teaching about a God who called for justice and dignity for everyone and who welcomed all to relationship, Jew and Gentile. This anointed teaching rabbi, Messiah, all great names for Jesus, had a lot to say in a short life. When Jesus saw Andrew's brother Simon without any introduction from Andrew, Jesus looked and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Does anybody else think that's an interesting greeting from Jesus? Right out of the gate, Jesus renamed Simon. In the ancient community, the name Simon meant God has heard. Perhaps Simon's parents had prayed for a son and felt that God heard that prayer, thus his given name. It's not a bad name. It certainly implies that Simon's parents saw him as a blessing. And yet Jesus changed his name right off the bat. And the name Jesus gave him that we refer to commonly as Peter, that name is important for it is translated rock. Remember, for those who are familiar with Peter's role as Jesus' disciple, his was a key role. And it was a roller coaster. For this rock disciple with Jesus was at all the critical moments in his life and ministry. Jesus, on this very first encounter, saw not just a new disciple, but one in whom he would anchor the early church. Remember that Matthew's gospel said that Jesus said, Peter, I will build my church upon this rock. I will build my church. But it was also this rock that denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. It was this rock who moved along the tension between total buy-in of Jesus and total sell-out of Jesus. 
And yet Jesus named him and calls him Peter the Rock throughout the roller coaster ride. From the time they climbed into the front seat together, all the climbs and deep drops, Simon Peter, two names, one given by his parents, one given by God. And how Peter was used. And I don't know about you, but that gives me great hope. That someone like me and you and Peter who can be on a roller coaster rock can be named rock and used. I asked Eric to read our First Testament reading this morning alongside our New Testament reading. Isaiah 49.1 concludes with, The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, He named me. I love the coupling of this reading with John's story. When I went to serve as student minister in the summer of 2008 at First Congregational Church of San Jose, California, my ministerial mentor and supervisor was Nancy Peters, the gifted associate minister of that amazing church. I'm not so sure why her given name was Nancy. She never really talked to me much about that. But what she did tell me is that she never felt like a Nancy. Dawn's faith and ministry journey shares some similarities with mine. Oh, who's Dawn, you might say? Well, my friend Nancy changed her name to Dawn Grace Peters. And she did this during my summer in San Jose. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I thought that was a bit odd. Why would someone change their name? I mean, she was going through all the legal procedures. No easy task, as I can testify, having recently changed my last name to Morris Charles to reflect my connection to and commitment to Brenda. It is not easy. There is a lot of stuff to change. Nancy Peters was changing email addresses and all the important documents in her life. It's as if Nancy Peters was vanishing. Or at least I thought so. I remember moving moments in this transition when Nancy shared with me that the senior minister said to her, well, I guess we need to change your name on our letterhead and all the church information so that your new name is identified correctly. Reverend Nate Miller, another mentor that summer and the senior minister was saying, we want to embrace you fully. Nancy's love and devotion to the church was so evident. So to save costs, she just assumed that her old name would stay on church documents until it was time to reorder supplies. But Nate wouldn't have that. He insisted that things be changed so that folks could begin to accompany her on the journey from Nancy to Dawn. The name Dawn Grace Peters wasn't just pulled out of a bag. Dawn Grace, formerly known as Nancy, spent considerable time reflecting upon her life, her dreams, and discerning who she was. She chose Dawn Grace as her new name because that's who she felt like she was. I've emailed her a copy of today's sermon. Maybe it will spur some conversations between us on the deeper issues of her name change. She will marry her partner, Bailey, in just two weeks. I've been invited, uh, Brent and I have been, and we're so sorry we can't make the trip there. Maybe she'll change her name again. Who knows? For a while, it was a bit awkward for people to remember her new name. I asked for her pre-forgiveness and said, Nancy, I've never heard of anybody doing this. I'm just a country girl from Kentucky. And out here in California, y'all doing some crazy stuff. And I asked her, I said, forgive me for times that I'm going to call you Nancy instead of Dawn. But sooner than I thought, I made the adjustment. And in fact, when I was writing this sermon and thought about her, I had to stop and think, what was her old name? I've come to recognize the importance and courage it took for her to claim a name she felt was more her, for whatever reason. 
For she and God know the name to which she answers best. When I was born, my parents gave me the name Marcia Jean. I'm still not quite sure where Marcia came from. It wasn't a family name, just a name my dad liked. But my middle name, well, most of you know where that came from. I'm named after my mom, Jean. I didn't much like it when the tagline in school was, Mean, Mean, Marcia Jean. <laughs> Although, in truth, I probably deserved it a few times. But I've always loved the outward name connection to my mom, except in those times when I made bad decisions and I didn't want her name to be associated with mine. Marcia Jean. J something Duggar. Rabbi. Messiah. Simon. Peter. Nancy. Dawn Grace. Names tell us a lot. This morning I wonder about two names. What names do we call God? And what name do we hear God calling us? As John's story continues, <coughs> other disciples are called to follow. And each of them come with different expectations. Some needed a teacher, others a Messiah. Some needed a fulfillment of Scripture, and each of these needs was met. My brothers and sisters, what do you need from God this morning? What might you call God? Healer, forgiver, leader, comforter, challenger? And I wonder what name God might be calling you. For I hear in this scripture story an invitation to move beyond Marcia Jean into a journey of growth and discipleship which moves me beyond that given name and into God's naming of me. I am more than Marcia Jean. I am God's own, uniquely created for purpose in God's world. And you, so are you. Hush, hush, somebody's calling my name. Hush, hush. Somebody's calling my name. Hush, hush. Somebody's calling my name. Oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, what shall I do? 